Good evening and welcome. I'm Kevin Young and I teach in the UMass History Department. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that UMass Amherst stands on Nonantuck land. Most of us, wherever we are, are inhabiting land wrongfully taken from indigenous people. And we have a responsibility to address the historic and ongoing crimes against their nations. As some of this year's events emphasize, the struggle for indigenous rights is intimately tied to the struggle for climate justice. I'd also like to acknowledge the historic and ongoing role of UMass and our other institutions in contributing to ecological destruction, particularly in the form of greenhouse gas emissions. And to invite us all to work to reduce our institution's ecological footprints and to pursue redress for the victims. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce the panel, Environmental Policy in Historical Perspective. This event is part of the Department of History's biennial Feinberg Family Distinguished Lecture Series, which is made possible because of the generosity of Kenneth R. Feinberg, a 1967 department alumnus and his friends and family. Each iteration of this series focuses on a topic of clear and compelling concern to society and invites audiences to consider historical context, analysis, and experience to better understand the topic at hand. This year's series is titled Planet on a Precipice, Histories and Futures of the Environmental Emergency. It seeks to deepen our understanding of the environmental emergency through historical analysis, and in so doing, help us envision constructive paths forward. For more information about the series, to register for future events, including next Wednesday's event on extractivism, geology, and power, and for the list of our more than four dozen community and university co-sponsors, please see the series website. If you're watching on Zoom, you can look in the chat box for information about how to turn on live closed captioning or to listen to tonight's event in Spanish. Following the event, I would like to invite you to join us for 25 minute discussion groups hosted by, by volunteers from our community, including community organizers, librarians from Forbes Library, graduate students and faculty. We are excited to announce our latest project, Dreaming the Future, a zine about our relationships with the earth and imagining possible climate futures. This zine is created by and for young people and is organized with the Forbes, Lilly, and Jones libraries. If you're 18 or younger or know someone who is, please take a look at the chat box. Some submissions are due on January 1st and on February 1st, we'll publish the zine in conjunction with the Feinberg event, Young People Fighting for Climate Change. Now it's my honor to introduce our moderator for the panel, Ashwin Ravi Kumar. Ravi Kumar is a political ecologist and climate justice advocate and teaches courses on environmental justice and politics at Amherst College. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashwin Ravi Kumar, and I teach in the Amherst College Environmental Studies Department. With Joe Biden's victory secured, if still baselessly contested, we have been able to relish a gasp of air in what has been a suffocating era in US politics. And as someone concerned with climate change, I have felt a potent mix of conflicting feelings. On the one hand, it is heartening that Biden has committed in his rhetoric $2 trillion to addressing climate change. On the other hand, the plan does not involve any discussion of reducing excessive consumption and industrial activity, nor is the sum really adequate to what is required to avert a horrifying century of climate violence. And Biden's track record suggests that only a sustained movement will push his administration to take any meaningful actions, especially with the GOP's strength in Congress. On the one hand, it is beyond inspiring that the movement for Black Lives has made a real political possibility of defunding the police and reallocating those resources towards programs that keep communities safe and create space for the most oppressed peoples in the US to participate in envisioning and building a new economy that is actually compatible with a livable planet. On the other hand, the Democratic Party has moved quickly to distance itself from 
uh, from this movement and even to blame it for how close the election was. A very curious reading of exit poll tea leaves while seemingly ignoring the fact that centrist liberalism did pretty darn badly at the polls in 2016 before defund the police was really a slogan. But despite these moves by the Democrats, for some Democrats, we in the climate justice movement know that climate justice is fundamentally about and requires racial justice, and that we can't have climate justice without repair and resources for Black communities and movements led by Indigenous people. On the one hand, it is hopeful that Biden's administration might put international cooperation in some forms back on the table by putting the US back into the Global Paris Climate Agreement, for example. On the other hand, the Biden administration has repeatedly put the US military close to the center of its thinking about climate change, as if woke green war is what we need, rather than an absolute reduction in the footprint of the murderous US military machine, along with a massive reorientation towards real international climate solidarity and repair. To navigate these contradictions, we need clarity of analysis and a political strategy that builds with the movements and organizations who are already on the front lines of these struggles. All of this is to say that I am delighted to moderate and introduce this panel of speakers that's with us today. We have Bill McKibben, author and co-founder or founder of 350.org, who will be speaking to us about the context of the climate emergency and what the election may mean perhaps for radical demands in the movement. Uh, Bob Pollan, an economist at UMass, will speak about the global political economy of climate change and bridge this with the context of action here in the United States. Eve Vogel, a political and environmental geographer at the UMass Institute for Social Science Research, will talk to us a little bit about the original New Deal and some of the policy context that led to major victories for vital constituencies in the past, with key lessons for the present. And Thea Rio Francos, a political scientist at Providence College, We'll speak about how greening the US economy might impact global value change. I think challenging us to think about why we need to fundamentally transform our economy rather than simply replacing a fossil fuel empire uh, with a solar and wind empire. An understanding that we badly need if we are to build the kind of international coalition necessary to bring about, bring about genuine climate justice. So we've got mass movements, an understanding of history and how political power works and a compassionate commitment to meaningful grounded international solidarity. Well, sign me up. I really hope that this conversation will sharpen our analysis of the present moment, provide us with inspiration concerning actionable steps that we can take to plug into movements. Uh, the political moment before us, while in some ways limited, is also tremendous. Not even industry can predict what the consequences of our advocacy at local, state, and federal levels would be. As the Democrats, the Biden administration, and other power brokers contemplate how to ensure their long-term political survival, we have a chance to show them how international climate justice is the only way to do that. Thank you all, and let's begin. So after the initial presentations, we'll be hosting a virtual Q&A, uh, taking questions for the panelists through a forum that we're posting into the chat box right now. Uh, and if you're tuning into the live stream, you can find it in the comments there too. If you're on Zoom and prefer to submit through the Q&A function, please feel free. All right, Bill, I will pass it to you. Thank you all so much for being here. Ashwin, thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks to everybody who um, asked me to be with you tonight. It's a real pleasure for me um, not to hear myself speak, but uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing Bob and Thea and Eve because they're really important um, thinkers. Uh, uh, let me just try and set a little context, a kind of uh, starter course for what will be an excellent uh, meal. Um, first thing to be said is, uh, as always, you can't talk about climate change without um, talking for a minute about just where we are physically on the planet. And where we are physically on the planet right now is with uh, the 30th tropical storm of this Atlantic season about to form, iota. We're deeper into the Greek alphabet than uh, we've ever gone before. Um, um, we're at the lowest sea ice level ever recorded in the Arctic for this time of year. Um, things are coming unglued and, and unglued fast. And people who've been <clears throat> watching in 2020 have seen epic fires from Australia to Siberia to South America to California. We've seen all the hallmarks of a real climate emergency. And we know, and this is important context for all discussion about what kind of change we need to make, we know that physics is at, in the end in charge here 
and that physics tells us that we have a very short period of time in which to make big changes. That shortness of time distinguishes this from other political problems. This one's time limited. If we don't solve it soon, we do not solve it. The IPCC in 2018 gave us our best guess. They said, if we haven't made fundamental transformations by 2030, which they defined as cutting emissions in half globally, then the chances of ever meeting the Paris climate targets go by the board. Um, so second context, of course, is the election, which didn't go as well as many of us had hoped and worked to see that it would happen. Um, uh, let's assume for the moment that our uh, president proves as inept at pulling off his uh, attempt at a coup as he has been at almost every other task to which he's devoted himself these past years and assume that uh, we get a President Biden on January 20th. Um, let's even assume for the, uh, because we, because we've got to hope we can because we've got to do a lot of work that we managed to win two Senate seats in Georgia. Um, there are superb candidates, including the guy who's in the pulpit of the church, Dr. King's old church, which is makes for me this a very resonant election in American history. But let's assume that we win that and manage to take by the narrowest of margins, the Senate. Uh, um, even then, I think the outcome of the election is pretty clear that we will not be having the massive $2 trillion Green New Deal plan that, that Joe Biden campaigned on. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that there are weak links even within that Democratic coalition. The weakest of them, Joe Manchin, the Senator from Virginia, West Virginia, who announced this week that he would not vote for filibuster reform or expanding the court or probably much of anything else. Um, um, so we're gonna have to figure out how to get a lot done without at least for the moment being able to do the very central things that, that uh, Biden campaigned on. And it's a great shame that we're in that position because in fact, in this last election, the Democrats were far more outspoken about climate change than any major political party has ever been in our political history. Joe Biden, in the last debate, walked right up and grasped the third rail of climate policy. He said, we have to transition away from the oil industry. And people tried to tell him it was a gaffe, but his campaign ran in the closing week of the campaign, five big ads around climate change. Clearly, they decided that this issue worked for, for them, not against them. And I think that they're right. They managed to carry, despite that statement, uh, Pennsylvania and Colorado and New Mexico and other oil parts of the country. Um, this is, is another way of saying that we're at a watershed moment in public opinion, finally. The accumulated weight of all of those disasters around the world, the knowledge spreading quickly through the population that the price of solar power or wind power has dropped 90% in the last decade and is now the cheapest way to generate power, and the building of a vast climate movement over the last decade here and around the world has been enough to alter the political equation in lots of ways. And in that characterization, the Senate becomes a kind of last readout of the fossil fuel industry from which they'll be able to thwart a lot of action, at least for the moment, but not all action. Um, and, and in fact, I think that there's big scope for a new administration to accomplish a lot of things that will be very significant, but they're going to take some help from the climate movement, and they're going to take some um, willingness and ability to exploit them when they do it. So what am I talking about? Um, I'm talking about the vast number of changes that we can make to regulation and policy that will add up to a serious thumb on the scale that'll make it harder for big oil to keep doing what it wants to do. And the good news is that climate 
activists and climate movement are very, very sophisticated now in a way that they have not been in the past. Uh, there are now thousands upon thousands of really talented people working on these issues, some of them policy people and some of them political people. And I, I will give particular pride of place to a UMass Amherst grad who's, I think, the may be one of the most important political players in this country in the years to come, my old friend Varshini Prakash, uh, who led the effort to divest UMass from fossil fuel, the successful effort early on, and now as head of the Sunrise Movement is a serious power broker in this fight. And we're just beginning to see you know, their ability to do things like influence appointments. They've made it clear that, for instance, that Ernie Moniz, the former Obama Secretary of Energy, will not be the Secretary of Energy in the uh, new administration. But they've also, they and many others, have come up with a long list of things that Biden can do without Mitch McConnell getting in the way that'll be really important. And I want to highlight one particular area because I think it's going to be utterly critical. And that's what they can do to influence the financial system. You know, we have an almost reflexive uh, 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 belief that political power and that political change only comes through political systems. Uh, and that's a very odd position for people on the left who uh, you know, uh, should have a much more uh, rich understanding of the fact that um, capitalism is a problem here and that uh, at the heart of capitalism is big capital, that is banks and asset managers and insurance companies. And they are possible to get them moving in entirely new directions. Um, um, we've watched over the last few years in the UK, as one guy, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, managed to make it necessary for banks and insurance companies to start figuring in climate risk and the risk of stranded assets. And we've begun to see the way that that plays out. We've also begun to see what movements can do in this regard, you know, we launched this Stop the Money Pipeline campaign about a year ago. I began 2020, it's so long ago, I can't even believe it was in 2020, but getting in January, getting arrested at the Chase Bank nearest the Capitol in DC, because Chase is the biggest funder of uh, fossil fuel in the world, a quarter trillion dollars since the Paris Accords. Forget Trump, I mean, these are the guys who were sabotaging uh, day and night, much more <laughs> with much more skill than than Trump brought to the process. Uh, our, our global efforts to get anything done. Um, we've kept the pressure up, though. Campaigning of this kind is hard during a pandemic. Uh, um, and a few weeks ago, Chase felt compelled to announce that from now on, their financial activities would be Paris compliant, uh, an airy phrase that I have a feeling will require some more people to spend some more nights in jail in order to fully flesh out uh, what it might mean. But the pressure is on, and this is a place where we can really work a kind of pincers movement. If uh, Elizabeth Warren as Secretary of the Treasury or uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin as uh, Governor of the Fed or Chairman of the SEC or something like that um, is able to put forward the kind of regulations that we need that force uh, a quick um, and thorough accounting of exposure to carbon risk um, um, and new rules about uh, uh, steering banks away from that kind of risk, well, that'll make a huge difference. Um, um, so I, I could go on listing for a very long time all the sort of similar tweaks and things around the edges that, uh, and, and the margins that we're gonna be able to do that could have big impact. Um, and I'm glad of that. I don't know whether they'll have impact on the scale we need in the time we need. Uh, and no one does. Uh, we're in playing in uncharted territory here. Um, or, you know, there are, as you know, scientists who think we may have waited too long at this point, though the best science seems to indicate that we have a narrow window, albeit one that's closing, 
Um, it's clear that this decade is the last decade, I think, with real leverage over what the final temperature of the planet turns out to be. And so we have to do everything that we possibly can. And we can't, therefore, just sit back and say, well, Mitch McConnell's in charge of the Senate. There's nothing we can do. Um, there's a lot we can do and will do. And I'll just end by saying we should not forget that we have brothers and sisters working in every corner of the world on this fight, many of them way in advance of what's happening in the U.S. Uh, my great fortune is I get to work with them all the time, um, um, every day about things. And I'm reminded just of the depth and history of this fight. Tuesday was the 25th anniversary of the murder of Ken Sarawiwa in Nigeria, a murder that for all intents and purposes was carried out by Shell Oil. Um, uh, and it's just a reminder of how long and how hard people have been putting themselves on the line to try and slow down this juggernaut. And now it's our time and we better get it done. Thank you so much, Bill, for those remarks. Um, I'm gonna be keeping introductions and bios of the speakers brief uh, in the interest of time, but you can find out more about them through links that I think have been dropped in the chat. Uh, so next up, we're gonna be hearing from Bob Pollan, an economist at UMass. Um, take it away. Thanks very much. And uh, thank you very much for having me uh, and being on this panel with such excellent people, Bill, Faya, Eve, um, so what I'd like to do is just sketch out a uh, program for a global Green New Deal, what it would entail, and then I want to bring it down to our current situation in the U.S. with some details, in particular about Pennsylvania. You'll see why. Um, so the, the notion of a Green New Deal, there's a lot of definitions, and uh, I want to give a basic, simple uh, meaning to the concept as I understand it. Uh, Bill referred to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC targets, which as he said, is a roughly a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030, which is only nine years from now, and net zero uh, emissions by 2050, which is 29 years from now. Um, so as I understand it, the uh, Green New Deal project is a project to hit those emission targets, or maybe do better, but at least hit those emission targets and to accomplish this in a way that also uh, expands job opportunities, uh, raises living standards, mass living standards, and is consistent with reducing poverty and raising uh, well being throughout the world. That's what I mean by a global Green New Deal. And of course, the term New Deal is supposed to evoke the 1930s New Deal that was an egalitarian uh, project to get out of the depression. This is an egalitarian project to get out of the most fundamental crisis uh, the, the globe has faced, a, uh, an existential crisis. And also it so happens to get out of the uh, recession that we're in now, which would mean a green recovery. So the centerpiece of the global Green New Deal, as I understand it, is the transformation of the global energy system. It's not only that, but that's the centerpiece because roughly 70% of all emissions come from burning oil, coal, and natural gas to produce energy. So in the work I've done with co-authors, uh, we've estimated the costs the investment costs, and it's not just a cost, but I'll first talk about the cost, the investment costs of hitting that target of a 50% reduction in 10 years and a net zero econ emissions global economy in 30 years. Uh, and that's about two and a half percent of global GDP, of global economic activity, two and a half percent. It's a lot of money, it's about, you know, initially somewhere in the range of $2 trillion uh, in investing in two things, two big things, uh, energy efficiency and uh, solar and wind, clean renewable energy sources, which will supplant our existing fossil fuel dominant system where 80, 85% of all energy now is uh, generated by fossil fuels. 
Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the basic program. And uh, this is an international program. So when we talk about international solidarity and we, when we have time, we can talk about how we pay for it. But I would argue that the countries that are responsible for having generated the climate crisis should also be paying for most of the solution to the climate crisis, including investing in developing economies. Uh, it is not a program strictly uh, based on public investment, government spending. Uh, it is a pub program that entails uh, combinations of public and private. There's a lot of co investments in energy co-ops, especially in Western Europe now, but other places as well. One place that you might not know about is Alaska. Uh, there's some very interesting developments there. Um, in fact, if we were to say the solution is public ownership of, of, of energy assets, well, we've already solved the problem because 90% of the world's fossil fuel assets are owned already today by public enterprises. So that's not a solution in and of itself. Now, this project uh, of investing to transform our energy system will be a major source of jobs, of job creation. And that's a big part of why I say the Green New Deal by uh, transforming our energy system will also be a source of uh, opportunity, of expanding opportunity, of jobs, of good jobs. So it's jobs because we're spending money to build a new energy system. It's jobs for people in solar energy. It's jobs for people in energy efficiency. It's jobs for accountants. It's jobs for lawyers. It's jobs for solar engineers. It's jobs for secretaries. Uh, a recent paper that I put out with co-authors just a few weeks ago uh, estimates in the US on average, uh, 20 to today to 2050, we would uh, generate about 4 million jobs per year in the US. Uh, and about 160 million jobs globally at two and a half percent of GDP. Now, when we build out the green uh, uh, energy system, that means the fossil fuel energy system transforms down to zero. And that has to happen, absolutely, as Bill said. There's no choice, it has to happen. There's no other way to stabilize the climate. Uh, now, the uh, con contraction of the fossil fuel globally industry is going to mean job losses, and it's going to create harm to communities that are dependent right now on fossil fuels. So what's the solution there? Very straightforward. We have to invest in just transition for the workers and their communities that are currently dependent on fossil fuels. Saving the planet means treating these people and communities fairly. Otherwise, the level of resistance to trans transition is going to be too big to overcome. The good news is it's not hard to do this. It's easy to do this. Uh, the paper I just cited, you can look at it if you want. It's part of the uh, America Zero Action Plan study. Um, what we estimate in the US, uh, and if we take coal, oil, natural gas, and ancillary industries, we're looking at job losses in the range of 25,000 per year on average. That's after taking account of attrition by voluntary retirement, the number of people who are gonna lose their jobs and are gonna to need to be getting new jobs about 25,000 a year. Remember the number I said for job creation through clean energy is 4 million. 4 million versus 25,000. All 25,000 people need to have a guarantee of a new job, a, a new job that pays them just as much, uh, to need to be retrained if, if necessary and uh, relocated. And we've estimated the cost of that, generous numbers for all of that. Uh, two, $3 billion a year, over the 2050 period, we're looking at one one hundredth of 1% 1 of GDP for a very generous just transition. Now, let me just bring it down to Pennsylvania for a minute. Pennsylvania was featured uh, in the campaign and as Bill mentioned, uh, Joe Biden at the end of the last debate said, we're gonna transition out of, uh, out of fossil fuels. But then he also said, oh, no, 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 no. 
uh, we'll never get rid of fact fracking in Pennsylvania. Uh, and that became a big issue. Let me just describe a little bit about the fracking industry in Pennsylvania uh, relative to the opportunities for clean energy. So if we were to invest two and a half percent of activity GDP in Pennsylvania in clean energy, we estimate, and we put out a study on that just a few weeks ago also, about 175,000 jobs per year. We also estimate that if you wind down fossil fuels, fracking and everything, uh, coal and, uh, and oil uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, we're looking at at most 1,800 jobs lost per year versus 175,000 jobs created per year. Again, all 1,800 people deserve a just transition. It's part of the project. But to find good jobs and to help people relocate as needed, 1,800 people is nothing. It's simply a matter of will. And so it was unfortunate that Biden couldn't say in the debate and elsewhere, yes, we're gonna wind down fossil fuels. Yes, we're gonna wind down fracking in Pennsylvania because that's what we need to do to save the planet. But we are gonna take care of each and every person who is facing job displacement as a result of this. Uh, the fracking industry, besides the, uh, it has created economic benefits for a small number of people, but we all know it's also created severe negative environmental impacts, such that a grand jury just in June of this year put out a report talking about the uh, contamination of the water supply. Uh, the contamination of the air, the noise pollution, uh, massive problems. Uh, on top of everything else, another study came out that said property values in the communities where fracking is being taken place, property values have fallen so much that uh, school systems have lost about $1,500 per pupil as a result of fracking. So we have to tell this story that the transition to a green new deal, a green energy, energy economy is the thing that we need to do to save the planet. It will also be a project to expand jobs, expand opportunities, clean the environment, improve schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, next up, we're gonna hear from Eve Vogel, a uh, political and environmental geographer uh, at the University of Massachusetts Institute for Social Science Research, I believe, right? Take it away. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really honored and excited to be part of this panel and just part of this really important discussion. So um, I uh, am a geographer, which means I think visually. So I think I'm the only person in this group who has a PowerPoint. So is that going up or do I get to see it? Thank you. Is this the, um, the, uh, the original one? Is this the new one? Oh, this is okay. All right. So my role in this panel is to provide some historical perspective and maybe with the, uh, a bit of a cautionary tale. I'm gonna talk about some earlier efforts to create progressive sustainable energy and offer a few thoughts about some of their long-term legacies and lessons. My main focus is on a few aspects of the original New Deal that were about green progressive renewable energy linked to environmental conservation. At the end, I'll mention a couple aspects of a more recent effort that might also be called a green energy policy effort, electrical restructuring. So go ahead and um, click forward. So the New Deal was not at all just about jobs and infrastructure. The 1920s and 1930s were decades when people were concerned about deforestation, devastating floods, dust storms, rural poverty, and the very survival of capitalism and democracy. Among the most innovative responses were River Valley authorities. The TVA was the only official River Valley authority that was ever created in the US, but a more limited version was created in the Pacific Northwest on the Columbia River, the Bonneville Power Administration. 
And since our time is limited, I'm not gonna describe these agencies in detail, but just give you enough background to be able to go on to highlight some legacies and lessons. So uh, at this point, I'm actually gonna let people um, read rather than reading at you for a minute, uh, just some of the ideas and goals behind these two agencies. So um, it does very much echo what Bob was just talking about, about the vision of the Green New Deal. So next slide, please. So federal hydropower through the TVA, the BPA, were not only about those tangible benefits, but they were also about local democracy and ownership. So one of the key things about federal hydropower is that it has always been sold preferentially to public and cooperative utilities. So those are the logo, logos from Seattle City Light and Mason County uh, Public Utility District, both of which were created, as you can see, 100 to 85 years ago and are still with us today. Since this is a panel on environmental policy, I wanted to show you a list of some of the policies and government agencies that made this all work. So next slide, please. And again, I'm going to let you just look at it rather than read it all to you. And I wanted to emphasize, you'll see here, that um, it wasn't just things that happened at the federal level, and it wasn't just things that happened during the New Deal itself. There were other things that happened at the local state level that made all of those things possible. Um, and then click forward. So all of these still exist, except for the Public Utility Holding Company Act. Um, so Sean, just so you know, I've got some animations going on. So when I say click forward, just click and uh, don't click twice until I tell you to go to the next slide. All right, <clears throat> so this is where I'm gonna uh, go a little slower here. So what are some of the legacies and lessons and, and continuing tools from these agencies? Number one, the idea of building policies that can join environmental conservation, inclusive social benefits, strong government support, clean energy, and local democratic ownership and participation with a federal New Deal is not new. Anyone who says it's un-American, that's bunk. This makes the history, though, of how this constellation developed and played out over time incredibly informative for thinking through how to approach those things today. Um, just click forward, but don't change the slide. <clears throat> okay, and one more. Great. The long-term results of ambitious programs like the TVA and BPA are mixed. Institutions and programs are shaped not only by their visions and initial leaders, but also by later leadership, by changing political economies, by the limitations of politics and budgets during phases of implementation, by the fact that large-scale implementation of physical infrastructure and social and economic programs may have quite different impacts from small scale ones, and that success often depends on a whole host of other material and social change. Also, what is progressive in one era may not look as progressive in 30 or 50 or 90 years. So on that note, next note, Although policymakers and planners of the New Deal thought they were inclusive and encompassing, there were things they missed. It wasn't until decades later that new interests arose successfully to fight for some of the people, places, and species that paid the cost for their well-intentioned plans. The TVA and the BPA accelerated a massive buildup of large federal dams. It took decades before floodplain farmers in the Tennessee Valley and advocates for fish and river ecosystems in the Columbia Basin among them Native Americans with treaty reserved fishing rights began to win back some of the heavy losses they had suffered. Next. Fundamentally, the New Deal was also premised on resource development and increased consumption. And these ultimately had profound environmental impacts. The success of electrification also meant the promotion of millions of electrical appliances and gadgets all built with other more distant natural resources, as well as more and more electricity, eventually prompting the TVA, once all the dam sites on the river were taken, to invest in massive coal plants and nuclear power, and the BPA to get embroiled in its own nuclear power investment fiasco as well. Next point. 
many mobilized to fight the TVA and the BPA and the New Deal more broadly because there were impacts on other agencies' authority and other companies' profit. One of the ways they mobilized was through discourse. They portrayed these agencies as communist and communism as evil. The original New Deal was possible because there had already been three years of depression before FDR was elected and because there had been growing support for movements and initiatives even further to the left, including strong worker and communist movements. FDR got voted in by a landslide in both 1932 and 1936, and Congress was overwhelmingly from his party. Even so, within a few years, there was growing resistance and some New Deal programs were struck down by the courts. Next point. We still have many institutions that were created on around the original New Deal that have progressive potential and which could be made visible again and reharnessed. In our eagerness for the new, we should be cautious about discarding the hard won laws and institutions of old. All right, next. So of this list, these include things like state utility commissions, public and cooperative ownership of electricity, river basin power agencies, and FERC's authority to regulate interstate transmission and wholesale electricity. But for these to be progressive, people have to pay attention to these seemingly boring agencies and their regulatory powers. Commissions cannot be captured. The public has to select utility boards that care about progressive environmental and social aims. And big federal agencies need to be held accountable to progressive social and environmental interests. Also, regulation that limits financial ownership, consolidation, and obfuscation can make a real difference. Besides Glass-Steagall, there was the Public Utility Holding Company Act. It was weekend starting in 1978 and fully repealed with barely any media or public notice in 2005. Absent PUCA oversight, electric companies have gone through repeated mergers and sales since restructuring, grown into many armed corporate hydras with limited public or corporate accountability dominated electric governance in some regions with dozens of voting subsidiaries, and they are beginning to engage in widening corruption. Uh, how much more time do I have? I don't see a clock. Or the chat. So go ahead to the next slide. With that, I want to jump forward briefly to the era when PUCA was undone, which was ironically another era of policy change inspired in part by a desire for greener energy, the era of electric restructuring. I've left the word deregulation here if crossed out because the impetus for electric restructuring was linked to the broader deregulatory movement across the world, a trend some put under the banner of neoliberalism. How was electric restructuring about green energy? The idea was that by unbundling utilities from generation plants and making generators com compete for customers, we could get rid of the large, old, inefficient generation plants and end utilities dependence and insistence, always on building more and more generation. New Englanders were leaders in making this connection. So what you're seeing on the right is on the top, there's a picture of an old utility that has generation transmission and distribution. And on the bottom, new utilities of today that have only distribution, the big old electrical coal plant or nuclear plant is gone. And we've had a proliferation of small competitive generators, most, mostly natural gas, that now are providing most of the energy to our transmission system as well as to end users. Next slide. These are just some of the laws and policies of electric restructuring. And go ahead to the next. Keep going. Sorry. Um, just actually scroll through all of these till we get to the bottom of number four. Perfect. So the short version is that there were many of the same long term problems um, and some different ones that arose with electric restructuring is linked to an effort to have green energy, just like the earlier wave. So even though ideologically it seems completely different, one is getting rid of government, the former was big government, in many ways both produce more consumption, more energy generation, 
and um, difficulty reining in those in power. Next. I just want to end with an image of two maps. Both of these are places where a competitive wholesale electric market to the south, California and New England, is linked to a large public hydropower producer to the north, Bonneville Power Administration and Hydro-Quebec. In both cases, the southern region is looking at importing more and bringing that hydropower into a more marketized system while the northern region is looking away at it as ways to earn greater profit through the flexibility of selling when prices go up. And it's just an image of how these things uh, are still with us, both eras, as well as their complex interface and the way that if we don't see these interconnections, the, the physical interconnections that link places like Boston to places like um, the James Bay or link Los Angeles to the Grand Coulee Dam, we don't understand the wider implications of what we're doing. And with that, I will stop. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Eve. Uh, next up, we're gonna hear from Thea Rio Francos, um, who is a political scientist at uh, Providence College. Go ahead, Thea. Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, this has been an amazing panel so far and I'm also really looking forward to the Q&A after I finish. Um, so I'll start by saying something that in a way reiterates um, something that Bob Pollan was starting his talk with, which is that you know, we usually think of the Green New Deal in sort of purely domestic terms, I would say, especially in the US, that's the case. Um, but if we want to achieve what I take to be the two core pillars of the Green New Deal, which are rapid decarbonization and socioeconomic equality, we have to understand the global dimensions of both of those pillars. Um, and what I'm going to argue today is that the Green New Deal can and, and, and must, from my perspective, be aligned with those principles of, of global climate justice. Um, so the framework of global justice highlights two central facts about the climate emergency. The first is that it's global. So this emergency is a planetary condition. And this is something that at the very outset of our panel, um, uh, Bill McKibben laid out. The second is the justice piece. Climate change is deeply structured by inequality, um, resulting in the fact that those who have contributed the least to emissions and other forms of environmental degradation are the most vulnerable to their devastating effects. Um, but I want to point out today is that both the global and the justice are also very relevant, not just to the causes of the climate crisis, but also to the solutions um, to the climate crisis. In particular, the green technologies that we need to develop and massively deploy. So I'm talking about solar panels, wind turbines, lithium batteries, electric vehicles, among others, are produced via global supply chains. Um, so that's the global piece. But as currently organized, these supply chains are sites of social and environmental injustice. In what follows, I'll describe uh, pretty quickly the basic contours of these supply chains with a focus on electric vehicles. And I'll argue for how they might be reorganized in order to properly align with global justice. Before I begin um, that, the, the piece on global supply chains, I'd like to just speak briefly, just because I feel remiss not to, about the current status of the Green New Deal politically um, in the US and, and, and elsewhere. Um, so, you know, it's sort of a cliche to say that we're in a moment of unprecedented pandemic and economic crisis. And as Bill laid out, the climate emergency has also continued unabated. So we're facing, you know, at least a triple crisis um, uh, uh, globally. Uh, the Green New Deal, I would say, despite these sort of rapid and accelerating changes in the political context and public health in the economy, um, remains a, a quite salient framework, and not just from my perspective, but sort of in the policy world. So across the world, there are lots of calls for um, a green and economically just recovery. 
To varying degrees, uh, this approach informs policies that are being implemented in Europe under the banner of the Green Deal, um, in the UK under the banner of Build Back Better, in China, in South Korea, um, in Latin America, activists are calling for a new eco-social pact to guide uh, recovery from the pandemic um, and from the economic crisis. And of course, here in the US, Biden's victory opens up the possibility, though not uh, the guarantee of a green economic recovery. I wanna focus a bit on a, an element on his campaign platform that is pretty relevant to, to what I'll be talking about today. So um, as has already been pointed out, his platform calls for $2 trillion to electrify transit, construct a renewable grid, retrofit buildings, address climate, address environmental injustice and create millions of good jobs in the process. Biden of course rejected the Green New Deal label, but it's also clear that it at least influenced his proposals. And perhaps we can talk more in the Q&A about how these proposals might fare under the situation of a, a like the likely situation of divided government. But for now, I want to talk about his proposals in light of global supply chains and specifically in light of the extractive frontiers um, of electric vehicle manufacturing. So one of Biden's key goals, um, as stated on his campaign website, is to revitalize the US auto industry by promoting the mass production and also mass consumption. So this is kind of gonna um, echo a little bit Eve's points about consumption, the mass production and mass consumption of electric vehicles. He envisions this occurring through a domestic supply chain, meaning that in his, um, in his vision, the raw materials and manufacturing capacity to produce electric vehicles would reside here in US, within US borders. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on you know, your perspective, um, my research shows that this would be extremely challenging. The, the idea that we're gonna have a fully domestic supply chain for electric vehicles anytime soon. Um, for decades, uh, our industrial capacity has languished compared, of course, to China, but also um, to Europe. We can rebuild this capacity, but it will take time. And I think it would take a more muscular and kind of state-directed industrial policy than Biden would probably be comfortable with. Um, but what about the raw materials, which is a lot of what I'm going to focus on today? Environmentalists in a number of, of, of environmental organizations around the world are increasingly concerned about the quantity of mining that will be required to produce the millions of electric vehicles expected to be sold globally uh, over the next decade. That's because electric vehicles, which some of you in the audience may be aware of, some of you, this might be new information, but electric vehicles, while absolutely vital for reducing emissions in the transit sector, which is about a third of all emissions in the US, requires enormous quantities of mined materials rested from uh, the Earth's surface, 180 pounds of copper for wiring in an electric vehicle, plus lithium, nickel, graphite, cobalt for the battery, not to mention, of course, the toxic pollutants that are emitted during steel productions for the body of the car. Though here in the US, we do have domestic deposits of some of these materials, it's unlikely that the US will have enough capacity to fully self-supply anytime soon. Extractive projects require years to garner financing, pass through environmental regulations, and enter in production. Meanwhile, again, as Bill pointed out, the timeline uh, for, for climate action demands that we move quickly to dramatically reduce emissions from transit as well as other sectors. For the time being then, the extractive inputs for green technologies are largely sourced from the global south, such as cobalt from the Democratic Republic of Congo, nickel from Indonesia, and lithium and copper from Chile. The transition to electrified transit thus threatens to entrench the status quo of what some scholars call, quote, unequal ecological exchange, a system under which the global south pays the socioecological costs for global capitalism. For a more concrete idea of what these socioecological costs are, I'm going to zoom in for a moment on lithium batteries, which is what I'm what my research centers on at the moment. Lithium batteries are a key component of electric vehicles, um, as well as for storing intermittent energy on grids, that, on grids that run on solar or wind. So as I just mentioned, Chile is one of the world's top lithium producers. In Chile, lithium is, is extracted from the beautiful salt flats of the Atacama Desert, uh, where I visited last year um, when I was conducting field work. The process of lithium extraction and evaporation has a very concerning impact um, on the water system in what is the second driest place on Earth uh, after, the, uh, after Antarctica. The 18 indigenous communities in the immediate zones of lithium extraction have seen threats to their water access and their collective rights to prior consultation. In addition, workers at the lithium installations face repressive union busting tactics. 
we could tell similar stories for the production of solar panels and wind turbines, as well as for the other raw materials required to make electric vehicles and lithium batteries. Now at this juncture with that a bit more context, I'd like to sort of repose my question from the opening. Given the social, social and environmental impacts of green technology supply chains, how can a Green New Deal be globally just? And I'm gonna present about three ways that I think it can be globally just. Um, but as, as sort of Eve and, and Bill uh, were noting um, in terms of the broader politics of, of the New Deal and of the Green New Deal, we'll need to fight for these things. These are not the ways that policymakers are currently thinking about the Green New Deal. So it's up to movements um, uh, and civil society to kind of press for this approach. Um, so first and foremost, we must advocate for electrified mass transit, walkability and cycling over individually owned electric vehicles. The current consensus, um, uh, even among sort of well-meaning climate advocates is that the only way forward is for everyone to own an electric vehicle. Um, I disagree with that and think that we are at a critical juncture where we could change the transit system in more transformative ways. And we should do so for two reasons. One is that it'll make rapid decarbonization easier. And the second is that it'll require fewer raw materials. So regarding uh, decarbonization, which again is like a key tenant of the Green New Deal as well as the, the global uh, climate justice movement. Um, the more cars that we have on the road, the harder it is to decarbonize the transit sector. That's because, I mean, it's sort of common sense, but I'll just spell it out. Every single car needs to be swapped for an electric vehicle. That's a lot of swapping uh, to happen. Um, and also the more individual EVs on the road, the greater total demand for renewable energy to power them, which means the more renewable energy capacity we'll have to build in a very short amount of time. So more cars on the road, harder to decarbonize the transit sector. Uh, the more you have people moving um, in, using collective shared and mass transit, the, the easier it is to, to decarbonize. Um, second, uh, and, and a little more directly germane to, to my research, the more that we can move around in electric bustle, buses, walk or cycle, um, the fewer mined resources we use and the more people benefit from what we do pull out of the ground. Um, and ditto for the more that we can reuse and repair rather than participate in the compulsive consumption of manufactured obsolescence. So I'll just choose an example again from my own work, which is that uh, a lithium battery that may no, no longer be powerful enough to, to, to power or charge an electric bus would work beautifully to store energy on a renewable grid. So thinking about ways to reuse and repair um, rather than constantly manufacture and consume. Um, and then to end, um, uh, we will, as I said, you know, a few moments ago, still need to import things. I, I don't imagine like U.S. self-sufficiency. I don't think it's feasible in the near term, nor do I necessarily think it's a, it's a, it's a good goal. Though we can talk about that in, in Q and A. Um, so there'll still need to be economic exchange across borders and. For what we do need to import from elsewhere, whether it's raw materials or other components, since the US, um, as I said, um, doesn't produce a lot industrially right now, so we'll probably have to um, import manufactured components as well. I would argue that supply chain justice should be a tenant of our trade policy. What does supply chain justice mean? Again, it means thinking about the sort of nodes of the globally dispersed um, extraction and manufacture of goods and thinking about applying our principles of decarbonization and equality to each of those nodes. So thinking about the Green New Deal broadly as a, as a way to structure trade. So this would mean trade agreements that promote indigenous and workers' rights, ecosystem integrity, and account for the carbon embodied in traded goods. Such trade policies could also facilitate technological transfers between the global north and global south as a way to, um, to kind of uh, mitigate that, that the deep inequality of the global economic system that, that um, uh, uh, Bob Pollan already spoke about. So to conclude, uh, just now I've argued that the specifics of how we design and implement a Green New Deal in the United States have real world implications for communities and ecosystems around the world. Our everyday patterns of consumption reverberate on a planetary scale, just as the products of far-flung sites of extraction and production find their way into our homes, workplaces, and neighborhoods. It's misleading then to think of a US energy transition in domestic terms alone. As both the pandemic and the climate crisis bring into sharp relief, material interdependency is our shared condition on this planet. 
response shouldn't be to seek refuge in isolation or economic autarky, but rather to think through how to enact the principles of democracy, equality, and solidarity across unequal global supply chains. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Thea. Um, so we now have time for uh, question and answer. And uh, as a reminder, you can submit your questions through a form, which you can find in the Zoom chat uh, and the YouTube and Facebook comments. <clears throat> um, and if you're in Zoom, you're also welcome to just submit your questions through the Q&A function. Uh, Janina Garcia, a student at Amherst College, is helping me to curate these questions in real time. So thank you so much, Janina. Uh, and I'm going to be kind of synthesizing some of the questions that we found that are in so far um, that are kind of thematically connected. And we can kind of have a conversation about it. Um, so to kick things off, uh, one question that came in, um, and this is from a student member of Sunrise and daughter of undocumented immigrants, as they identified. Uh, how would we prioritize our most hard hit communities throughout this pandemic in the Green New Deal? How would we ensure that every American, especially people like undocumented immigrants and formerly incarcerated people, can reap the benefits of a Green New Deal? Um, and uh, I suppose that really is for everybody, but uh, I could either call on people or if anyone wants to raise their hand. The, the... Does anyone feel inspired to try to take that, Bob? Oop, Bob, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I, I really enjoyed listening to all the speakers and that's a great question. Uh, you know, the, the, at least as I'm thinking about the vision of the Green New Deal, which I think is very consistent, consistent with what everyone else said. Um, you, first of all, you know, having a, a jobs program as, as central to the Green New Deal opens up a lot of possibilities. We've heard for decades, literally for decades, you know, that you can protect the environment, you can get on a climate uh, stabilization path, but it entails a massive trade-off. And even the New York Times has run surveys. There's a massive trade-off. Sure, you can be for the environment or you can be for jobs. Choose one. Most people choose jobs. That's been the consistent result. Uh, the fact is there is no trade-off whatsoever. So that when we think about it as a jobs program, in fact, I wrote a paper in 2008 during the last recession called Green Recovery, uh, to think about it as a uh, jobs program in the short term, as well as a long-term sustainability program. And within that framework, yes, absolutely. We have to target the people that are most vulnerable right now. And that is uh, certainly well within the realm of possibility and it should be a central focus. If you're creating millions of jobs, then focus the jobs. For example, if we're thinking about jobs in disadvantaged communities, a very easy way to think about that right now, short term, is uh, retrofitting buildings because retrofitting buildings creates job opportunities across a range of people's skill levels. There's a lot of entry level jobs. And so that is just one way to think about it. And of course, we have to build into these job creation uh, labor union rights and building in the role of a, an expanding and strengthening labor movement. We have to have affirmative action so that uh, job opportunities are there for uh, people of color and women who are relatively disadvantaged in all of these sectors. And we have to have robust training programs to move people quickly into the jobs. Awesome, thank you, Bob. And I think one, one thing uh, that might be interesting to also reflect on uh, with this is specifically what can people insist upon who are advocates right now to avoid replicating some of the ways in which ostensibly universal programs have been racist in the past, have been uh, withheld from people of color, black communities, indigenous communities in particular. What does that look like? Um, Thea, do you wanna to speak to that? or any aspect of this next? Yeah, I'll say I'll say one thing to that and then I'll um, I'll segue into to what I was thinking when that question was asked. I, I co-sign everything that Bob Pollan said. I think this is an opportunity to use 
really massive public investment um, to uh, to sort of target historic injustices as we sort of build a new green economy. And I know that at this particular moment, that's like, that's a big task because again, the divided government thing, and we get into strategies of how to actually advocate for that, um, uh, maybe a little bit later in the conversation, but I do think that that should be the vision, right? Um, but I, I, wanna, I wanna say one thing to what Ashwin just said and then what I was originally gonna say. So, um, you know, Biden promised in that $2 trillion plan that a couple of us have alluded to that 40% of that spending would target, I think he calls it disadvantaged communities, but we could say frontline, we could say racialized, you know, we, you know how, what, whichever term is, is preferable. So I think that, you know, one of the tasks of advocates and activists right now is to hold him to that because there's really not a lot of detail in his plan of how that targeting would happen. And we know from the history of the US welfare state, like Ashwin just said, that, you know, not not only is there underinvestment and, and disinvestment in communities of color and working class communities, but there's also all of the bureaucratic difficulties of our sort of means tested welfare system that makes it really hard for folks to get the services um, and job training programs, all the stuff that, that Bob was talking about, um, uh, it, it makes it, there's a lot of like under enrollment even in existing programs. So I think that something different than the typical sort of means tested, really bureaucratically ornate approach would need to be necessary and something much closer to just like direct investment, block grants for communities, making sure that the money is going where it needs to go. So that's that's on that front. But let me actually flip this question around. I love the question, but the, the way I think of it is is less like, how can it be guaranteed that that the communities that the question asker listed would be the first to benefit? That should obviously be a concern. But what I would say is that it's those communities that have who that they're like historic mobilization and current mobilization that's resulted in the Green New Deal in the first place. So I don't think per se of communities just as like recipients um, passively of, of government spending, but rather as protagonists that have been the key actors in making the Green New Deal the sort of salient, vibrant vision that it is. Um, and I think, you know, so long as we continue, even under our pandemic conditions, like the dynamism of, of that social movement activism, I, I think that we'll to some extent be able to keep the pressure on though of course the divided government question is is key but i i guess i just want to frame those communities not just as recipients but also as like the activists that have made the green new deal what it is thank you thea i'm really glad that you made that point because over the last six months or so i've had a lot of conversations with people who are part of the environmental movement about how to think about the movement for black lives and one thing that i keep coming back to is that we can't have political power that we need to transform the economy without the deep participation of black and brown communities in the United States. And therefore any policy, any move that, liber that is liberatory for oppressed peoples is inherently gonna be part of any Green New Deal that works and is necessary to make it possible. Um, and I, I wanna take um, uh, one of the things that you just said there about the types of agencies that can do this kind of work and what those might look like. Um, because there was another question, a couple of questions that kind of spoke to that that I'm gonna try to sort of package together here. Um, so one person wrote, uh, having spent years trying to be the change in the broken spaces of finance and energy, I can honestly say I wasted all those good years. These systems, even within the auspices of the Green New Deal are likely to continue to be the same perpetrators, perpetrators of wealth inequality unless ownership is taken into account. Um, and so the question um, is, is there a way to reimagine and think about how to actually shift ownership in the economy? And kind of relatedly, are there new agencies that might need to be created that are different from the old agencies? Is the EPA up to the task of managing a Green New Deal, of regulating these same industries uh, that have kind of historically captured it through regulatory capture, um, that have ended up having industry people run these agencies? Um, or could we have something, and this was directed specifically to Eve, something like uh, the National Resources Planning Board, uh, but for the Green New Deal? Um, Eve, maybe do you, do you want to sort of start start off taking on that set of questions? Um, one one piece of it was directed at you, so. Yeah, so um, I'll say on all these issues, I'm 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 both hopeful and skeptical all at the same time. Partly because uh, with a you know a seventy to hundred year long time frame of how I think about these things, you um, you have both the progressive moments and the reactionary moments. So, for example, rural electric co-ops 
that were like this incredibly progressive thing in the 30s and 40s are now one of the electric sectors in the United States that's most resistant to uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and other kinds of programs because they are based in rural America, which has become very politically conservative, and because they are dependent on, you know, selling electricity for proceeds. Um, and similarly, a lot of public power utilities are also very conservative, and that's part of why I was saying like it's really important for people to actually pay attention to who the governing boards are of these really boring institutions because if you don't guess what they they do just what that last questioner said which they get dominated by the old power structures just like anybody does um the one thing that I have seen that's been effective over time is institutional competition so in the Pacific Northwest, in particular, there's both a really strong public power sector and there's a really strong private investor-owned power sector. And because both are relatively vibrant, there's been an ability for towns and counties to play them off against each other uh, in ways that have made one or the other more accountable. And it's not guaranteed in any way. It still requires people to pay attention, get run for boards, you know, run campaigns to get municipal ownership, which then <laughs> failing. But in the meantime, the local investor owned utility makes a lot of better promises. But that kind of institutional competition actually has turned out, at least from what I've seen, to be more effective than than either all public or all private ownership or, or, or systems. So this is, you know, again, this is not like uh, an easy, uh, I don't think there's an easy answer. I, I really just don't. I, I think you create systems that have the ability for people who get screwed <laughs> later to challenge that system, you know, and, and somehow systems of, of ongoing challenge need to be built in. <clears throat> Totally. Um, does anyone else want to speak to either the question of how to transform ownership or if we need to transform who owns uh, key sectors of the economy or the question of kind of government institutions? Do we need new agencies or different types of agencies to implement something like a Green New Deal? Uh, Bill, Bill, we haven't heard from you yet. Well, I'd, I'd say just that the, um, I mean, it's obviously unlikely that the federal government's going to do anything particularly radical in the next few years given its composition. But I got to say, it's easier to imagine solely because uh, the sums of money involved keep getting smaller. Uh, big oil is not really all that big anymore. Uh, you know, 300 billion bucks and you could buy, uh, basically buy the US oil sector tomorrow. Uh, Exxon is, you know, got passed by uh, Next Era Energy, a Florida-based renewables company is the biggest market cap in, uh, in the energy field. And the good news about that is not just that these completely venal and disgusting companies are getting beginning to, to falter. It's that as they do, their political power falters to one extent or another too. And that makes everything easier. That's really one of the biggest reasons. You know, when Naomi Klein and I started this divestment thing a decade ago, that was kind of the, the plan to see if you could start taking away their social license. The thing's gotten so big now that it's also constraining their access to capital and, and that's good. Um, and that's why I'm so hopeful that the, you know, the Fed and the SEC and Treasury and things may be able to accelerate uh, that decline. Uh, not just because of their these guys not just they don't just pollute the air they pollute our political system so thoroughly that it's very hard for good ideas to get off the ground thanks bill so there's a set of questions here that uh are kind of prim have primarily been directed at youthia um but there may be other people that want to comment on on them and i'm going to try to sort of synthesize them but there's a number of questions about uh are there ways or is there, is there any hope with battery technology and waste management technology that we can reduce the adverse impacts of waste associated with uh, all the extraction that we're going to need to electrify the economy and build up renewables in the economy? Uh, or is it, to kind of put another side on spin on it, is it in fact necessary to degrow parts of the economy 
Uh, and if so, what are some concrete policies that people can advocate for that would make that kind of smart and strategic degrowth in certain sectors uh, more politically viable to avoid the problems of waste, pollution, and exploitation that might come with just kind of more extraction for a green uh, economy that's the same as the current economy otherwise? Um, yeah, those are great, great questions. So there's a sort of technological question and innovation question about like, are there better ways to extract that are less environmentally harmful? And then there's a question about like, what is our kind of overriding system and norms of consumption? Um, how might we change those in ways that are politically pal palatable? Because we know that whenever we ta start talking about consumption on the left, like the right is like immediately there to tell us that we're trying to take away people's stuff, their hamburgers, their trucks, you know, whatever it is. And it, it's, it's actually, I would say, you know, and I don't mean to just be dismissive because aside from the Fox News attacks, which are ridiculous, um, Consumption is a tricky question for the left, right? Because on the one hand, we know that there are mil you know, many, many people in the world, in the US included, that don't consume enough, right? Like we have uh, people that are not making enough money, that don't have enough to eat, that don't have the healthcare that they need and the housing, right? So um, just having a blanket kind of statement that we should consume less is problematic, especially when you're speaking from a relatively affluent country in the global north, right? And, and so it kind of papers over the internal inequalities, but it also sort of presumes like a global we that needs to consume less, right? Okay, so just, I just wanted to clear that air a little bit because I think it is tricky to talk about consumption, but we should like lean into those to those difficulties because we do need to talk about consumption. Let me let me tackle the the tech question first because it's it's a little quicker and then I'll tackle the second question, but I'd, and I'd love to hear what other people have to say about this. Um, so technologically, yes, there are always like, better ways to extract. There's no way to make extraction not have any environmental or social impacts, I don't think. And when you're talking about non-renewable resources, I don't think that talking about like sustainability is a is like the most, uh, I think is a kind of like ideological mystification to talk about like sustainable extraction of non-renewable resources, but there is better and worse. And, you know, the problem is that in part due to the same structures of the global economy that I was talking about earlier and like a long legacy of colonialism and imperialism, um, the extractive and extractive firms go to the places with the weakest regulations, right? And so one of the issues is that there isn't a, a, there isn't regulatory will or capacity in the in the places where extraction occurs to actually subject firms to relatively forceful regulations that would force them to extract under um, using better technology. And if a firm doesn't need to invest in new R&D, they're not going to because it's a very expensive to develop new technology. So however, in lithium in particular, there are technologies that are that are less environmentally impactful, but they're not used at scale for the reasons that I just said, but we should be exploring them and pushing for them and um, holding lithium firms and, 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 and other firms across the supply chain accountable to use um, better technologies and in particular ones that use less water, because um, that's one of the biggest impacts of, of lithium extraction and brine deposits. Um, so back to the consumption question, um, you know, one of the ways that I like to think about how we need to shift our models of consumption, and this is what we argue in A Planet to Win, um, our co-authored book about the Green New Deal, is that we need to shift from like an individual privatized and highly unequal mode of consumption to modes of consumption that are public, shared, and collective. Um, not just because they're more environmentally rational, which I think they are, um, uh, meaning that similar, you know, similar resources shared by more people is like a more environmentally rational way to consume, but also because they're more joyous, they're more fun, they occasion relationships that are more egalitarian and reciprocal. And you know, honestly, I think that a lot of the pathologies of our political and economic culture. Um, are not unrelated to the forms of individualized, privatized consumption um, that that the sort that sort of regime of consumption that we live under, which I think creates sort of subjectivities that are more available to the right than to the left. I mean, I'll just put it that way to be to be brief about it. But I think that there, you know, there are real political implications of the way we consume. And if we consume differently, we might also do different politics. But it's a bit of a chicken and egg in terms of the political movements that would be necessary to change our our our, our prevailing mode of consumption. Um, but I'll pause there because I would love to hear other panelists if someone else wants to speak um, 
to these issues. Another way that I like to put that, what you just said is uh, we need to sell the program in terms of uh, you get to hang out in the park with your friends more, you know, which is a great thing that everyone wants. I, I mean, think. people enjoy this. That's the thing. I mean, the right wing is so good at demonizing the left, but like actually people like being together and doing things together and sharing things. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's not clear to me that that humans are naturally like competitive or, or atavistic, you know, it, at all. Um, and I think that, you know, there, that we should, that should be part of our Green New Deal vision. Yeah, public space rules and we should support a life that involves a lot of it. Bob? Uh, I, I, I will talk very briefly on a couple of uh, simple practical things. Um, first of all, in terms of the use of extractive materials, uh, for example, tellurium, which is used in the production of solar cells. Uh, the fact is right now, the recycling of tellurium, less than 1% of total supply, less than 1%. And that's true across other uh, relevant materials. Uh, if you think about raising the industry for recycling and creating incentives for recycling to maybe only 5%, uh, you know, that is a five fold increase in the supply of tellurium without having to, to dig up any new supplies at all. So we've, you know, just thinking in terms of some simple practical things uh, that can have a massive impact, increasing the, uh, increasing the uh, substitution of uh, new tellurium for recycled tellurium as an alternative. Secondly, uh, substitute materials. Uh, we, we know that we, you've seen when we've had uh, increased demand for some materials, then you get substitutes created. For, for example, with uh, neodymium, which is used in uh, solar panels and also in wind turbines. So uh, let's see, let's create the new materials and let's recycle our existing supplies. These are, you know, we can talk about much broader kinds of social and cultural issues, but these are some really simple things that can be built into the uh, Green New Deal. And third, uh, which is already happening, you make the uh, clean energy systems more efficient. That's why the price of solar panels has come down by, as, as Bill mentioned, whatever, 80% in eight years, massive improvement. That means that you can get 80% more electricity out of a given solar panel because they're more efficient. So that means that we don't have to waste as much materials to generate a given amount of energy. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot to try to get a, a few more questions in here. Um, so this is a very a, a different type of question, um, but I think it's really interesting. Um, uh, so this this person asks uh, many initiatives for green jobs focus on big and long term projects that often require high level skills. Uh, but I live in a city that has greatly increased cycling routes this summer. And that creates an immediate need for bike mechanics, for bicycle mechanics, which don't require an engineering degree or university education. Do you know of any projects or programs that speak to this kind of near term green job creation and enrollment? Um, or is anyone in touch with local organizations that maybe even you want to plug that are thinking about this kind of thing? I see Bob's hand. I build you on it. Well, there's, I mean, this is, bikes particular, there's immense amounts of great work going on uh, at the city level everywhere. Uh, and, you know, find out if there's a bikes not bombs in your neighborhood and, you know, I mean, just, but there's just terrific organizing around bikes in particular uh, all over the place. Some of it's bike advocacy for bike lanes, but a lot of it's just what she's describing, uh, you know. Um, and this is a perfect example of a, technology that everybody has in their, you know, a lot of people have them in their garage or wherever they store stuff. And a lot of the time they're not working very well. And, uh, you know, so there's been great community-wide efforts to get people's, uh, get people up and running again. I say this as someone who's uh, facing yet one more surgery to cope with the fact that I uh, went over the handlebars of my bike in July. So wear your helmet, whatever you're doing. Uh... Bob, did you wanna to speak to that or? Yeah, well, I would just say that, you know, again, the notion that uh, building the green economy is gonna be good for research scientists and solar engineers, 
is it will be, uh, but most of the jobs that will be created are everyday jobs, just like doing everything else. There's gonna be a lot of jobs for truck drivers. There's gonna be a lot of jobs for secretaries. There's gonna be a lot of jobs for accountants. There are gonna be a lot of jobs for people delivering uh, lunch to uh, the production sites. Um, you know, this is, when, when I say 4 million jobs, it's not 4 million jobs for solar engineers, though there are good jobs. Uh, there are gonna be a lot, a lot of jobs in construction. Uh, for example, as I was talking about with the um, uh, building retrofits, those are good, th those are jobs. Now, maybe, you know, right now they're not high, high paying jobs, but if you organize them, they can be better paying jobs. So, you know, it is a massive opportunity for job creation across the board. Great. Uh, Thea, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I just, I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that's been said. And I also kind of on, on Bob's last point, I want to just say that we can be really expansive about what counts as a green job, right? So, so one of the lines in, in A Planet to Win that we write is we need to build like the green new world and then we need to live in it. Meaning that it's not just about, though I agree about construction and the building trades and all that, but it's not just about that. It's also about the ongoing work of social care, right? Which is a huge employer in this country and should be a bigger one and a publicly supported and socially dignified one, right? So I'm talking about nurses and teachers and elder care and child care, which are by their nature, like extremely low carbon and low resource intensive work because they're all about human relationships, right? And so, you know, thinking about pink collar jobs, so-called also as green jobs, I think also just expands our sense of like who the constituencies are and like how a sort of female led multiracial working class could be at the forefront of what, you know, the green jobs kind of demands and movements are. If you want to see just the most beautiful example of the, you know, sort of playing out of this, look at just Google the video that Naomi and Avi Lewis and Molly Crabapple and others did the sort of second in their series of, you know, here's what the, here's what it would look like if we did a Green New Deal. Totally. So we've got three minutes left. Uh, I'm going to maybe try one more question and then we can wrap it up. Um, so this question uh, asks, how will Wall Street and ma massive financial institutions globally begin to be held responsible for mobilizing funding for the Green New Deal and divesting away from securities held within the fossil fuel industry? Um, and kind of relatedly, another question uh, is to do with uh, what, do we, what can be done to confront uh, transnational corporations and international agencies uh, that insist upon uh, free trade agreements and arrangements that can compromise uh, national actions that are environmental. Eve, we haven't heard from you in a while. I don't know if you would like to try to jump in there or you don't have to if, if someone else wants to. Bill? I'll just say quickly, since I have to go right at 730 in order to try and persuade the New York teachers, state teachers union to divest their uh, $200 billion pension fund. Um, uh, Look, this is a place where we can make huge progress fast. Um, you know, uh, there are two power centers in this country. One is, I mean, there's many, but two huge ones. One is Washington and the other is Wall Street. Uh, Washington at best takes a very long time to do things. And mostly for better, it no longer quite runs the world the way it once did. Wall Street remains unfortunately, hugely globally powerful, and things can happen there fast. You know, some big decision gets reflected in share prices in minutes around the world. So that's why we work so hard to try and pressure these guys. And if people are interested, Stop the Money Pipeline is this great coalition of groups from small environmental justice, you know, local groups to big, you know, Sierra Club, people like that. And it's and 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 as soon as the pandemic's over, there's going to be lots of opportunities for civil disobedience and that kind of thing. But in the meantime, there's tons of other ways to put pressure on these guys. It's somewhat easier to go after big banks than it is to go after oil companies because Exxon's going to fight to the last bridge. They only know how to do one thing. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase lends huge sums of money to the fossil fuel industry, but it's only six or seven percent of their deal book. So they're less completely committed to, uh, you know, if we can make it really painful and uncomfortable for them, they may well begin to wander away. In fact, there are slight signs of that already. So 
since you know, if you happen to be at an institution like Amherst College that has yet to divest from fossil fuel, that would be an excellent place to go and go to work. If you're at an uh, enlightened institution like UMass Amherst that already has taken that step, then figure out lots of other ways to join in this larger campaign against global capital. I mean, let's try going to the source for once. Thank you so much, Bill. And I know you have to duck out right now at 7.30. Um, this is when the Q&A ends anyway. Thanks so, so much to everybody for just great stuff. This was fantastic tonight. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone, so much for a uh, great discussion. Thank you to all the people who have hung out and listened and have asked great questions. Um, we would like to invite you uh, uh, to join us for brief 20 to 25 minute discussion groups immediately following this event. So right now, uh, facilitated by community volunteers uh, and co-sponsors of the Feinberg series. Uh, so these will take place in separate Zoom meetings. Please take a look at the Zoom chat box or the Facebook and YouTube comments for information about how to join. Um, all right, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you all so much and uh, enjoy the discussion uh, if you're gonna stick around and enjoy the rest of your night either way. <laughs>